Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today uh, on this Tuesday, May 31st. Can't believe it's already the end of May and we're going to jump into June here. Um, I hope everybody had a happy Memorial Day and uh, were able to enjoy the, the weekend. Um, I'm Robert Theobald, Small Business Ombudsman and Vice President of Small Business Services here at the Arizona Commerce Authority. And for those new to the Small Business Bootcamp, we'd like to start by thanking all of our community partners. We could not do these webinars, uh, these bootcamp sessions without our community partners, their time, their effort, and their expertise. So a little, about, a little bit about the Small Business Bootcamp. Um, it is a webinar series designed to help small businesses grow as we move forward. It's a statewide initiative supported by our community partners. And not only is it the Tuesday morning webinar, it is also consists or has a content library um, and also some workshops that we do with our community partners as well. So let's talk about those real quick. So first, the content library. Uh, we've been recording the, our webinars since we first began the Small Business Bootcamp over two years ago. And with that, we have a collection of over 200 recorded webinars that you can access at no cost at any time and review that content, those materials. Uh, we include the slide decks uh, as a downloadable option as well. Uh, so you can go back and review that and follow along. Um, there's a large number of uh, topics that you can go through. We've covered just about every topic and we continue to find new ones uh, to, to bring to the boot camp. Um, today's session later today will be included on the in the content library as well. Uh, so it's a great resource. You can also sort it, as you see on the screen there, there's seven different topics in which you can, or categories, which you can sort to help find the session a little easier. Um, let's jump into some of our other programs that the Arizona Commerce Authority has that uh, support small businesses. We have our small business services, our workforce division, and our Arizona MEP, uh, Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Uh, they're all here to support small business, small businesses and their growth um, in different ways. And so if you have any questions about those or want more information, feel free to reach out to us and we can get to that information and, and maybe contacts in those areas if you need them. Also another tool that we have that's available to everyone is our small business checklist. It's an online interactive uh, checklist that you can use to identify the commonly requested licensing, registration, and, and compliance needs at the local, state, and federal level as you start your business or expand your business. Uh, it's a great resource. Um, and you can find azcommerce.com forward slash small biz, B I Z, or the longer version on the, the web on the screen below. So let's look at some upcoming sessions. Um, Next week, we have our Your Growth Formula to follow up with today's session. Uh, it's also a standalone session that you can do, but uh, it does tie into today's session. And then the following Tuesday after that, we have our Best Practices for CRM Success. And then on Tuesday, June 21st, we have How to Avoid the Top 10 Legal Mistakes that Can Destroy Your Business. Um, and that's with Brian Burt from Snell and Wilmer. He's been on with us before, and it's a great presentation. Uh, to help understand some of those legal challenges that every small business can face and how to avoid them. So with that, we want to jump into today's session and introduce our speaker for today. We have Donna Hoover Ojeda. Uh, she's a co-founder and chief strategist at Mighty Underdogs. She's been involved with SCORE. She works at the U University of Arizona uh, Tech Launch uh, down there and a number of other programs to help small businesses grow and expand and succeed. So really excited to have Donna with us today. So Donna, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and go ahead and turn the time over to you. While we're letting Donna get set up, please remember to post your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we also wanna thank Faith for covering for me last week while I was out on vacation. I know she did a great job. So thank you Faith for, for being here last week's session. And Donna, it is all yours. Figuring out how to unmute when you're already screen sharing. They let you take a vacation? Yeah, I uh, was on vacation and, and I was, I traveled from Nogales, Arizona to the Canadian border up near Glacier National Park. And 
uh, saw the seven national parks that are on that route, took pictures. I'm writing a story for a magazine as well. So my vacation was actually a, a side gig work project, but it was a fun uh, one. So I got to spend time with my boys and see the country. So it was a lot of fun. Oh, that's great. That's great. What a, what a wonderful trip. A lot of state parks to see up in that direction. And you were just picking on me about taking manufacturing plant tours on my vacation. So we do we do what we like, right? Yes, exactly. So thank you very much for allowing me to be here and to share um, growth strategies is the area that I'm an expert in and have been working on growth strategies since 1987. Um, this is the I saw you have sessions one, two, and three of working with startups and. Uh, your third one is working on growing businesses. And I wrote down that you do procurement and marketing. And that's what we're going to talk about today in both of those areas. I don't do marketing and I don't do procurement, but the barriers to growth is really about how to use your resources and how to increase sales. So when we talk about barriers to growth, it's for existing companies. Um, you're no longer a startup after you're about, after you've completed your first three, well, three years. I was telling Robert that um, I work with a lot of companies that are four, five, six years old. They're still in a startup phase, but yet they don't qualify for startup work anymore, funding anymore or support because they're, they're actually producing and making things happen. And so how do we help you grow um, and scaling is not the same thing as growing. So they're related, but it's not the same. You can be a solopreneur, have a really good business, and you don't have to scale. It's how do we make $3 million and just stay a nice little company? And it is possible. So the barriers to growth kind of gives you a view of what people in business face. I've worked with over 5,000 companies in 35 years and from Europe and North America communities. Uh, most of them are large family owned business, businesses from about 35 million to 850 million. They're trying to get to a billion. There are different stages of your business life that you go through and some standard things that you run across. So again, barriers to growth and we'll cover uh, the three areas for profitable growth, because that's what we're looking for. What I wanted to mention, too, is that the game of business is time over money. The game of business is time over money. It's how do you spend your time to make the most amount of money? And that's what we're always looking at. How do we make more and work less? So the three places that I run into over these 5,000 companies that I've seen patterns and trends that we'll cover are leadership issues, systems and structure, and market dynamics. We have, I wanted to give you a little perspective that there are 41.4 million companies registered the US um, business tax returns. And that comes from the SBA and it also comes from labor statistics of how many companies are registered and filed taxes, 41.4. 98% of those, 98% have less than 10 employees. And my guess is most of the people on this call are one of those people. And I wanted to show you here that of how is that broken up? I see that it says 96, should be 98, 98%. 4% of those move forward to be 10 million. And then there's 17,000 that go to the 50 million and 2,500 2, that go to 1,000 employees and above. But for today, we're gonna to be focusing on this part down here. How do I get to a million? And these brick walls here, are these, these are standard walls that, that every company runs into as they grow through their different challenges and stages of their business life. So once you start a company, that's down here at the beginning, you start, and then when are you no longer a startup? And when do you become, when do you run into this first wall? And what's on the other side? These are very predictable barriers that people run into. 
And so that's what we wanted to talk about today. In the leadership piece, it's delegation is what most people run into. And what is delegation? The things that I hear about um, is I don't have anyone to delegate to because we're, business isn't meant to be played alone. It's meant to be played with others. So you, you do need to include others. Sometimes we call them stakeholders. The stakeholders is a, a bit of an old term because stakeholders typically we think of people that are outside of our company and they just look in or help me periodically. They have a stake in my company, but they're not really part of my tribe. So how do we make them, you know, how do we get people to help us grow our business and develop our business? You can start your business by yourself, but how do you grow it? And you need others to help you with that. You need the Robert Theobolds, you need government to help help you. You need the SBA to help you, SBDC to help you. You need your bank, you need your lawyer, you need your accountant. You need, you need your customers to help you grow. So in employees, it's your resources. That's a procurement piece that the organization talks about. So who do I delegate to when I don't have anybody to delegate to because I'm just one person? So we'll talk about that. I'll give you a tool that you can use to visualize how to work through delegation because you can delegate to your customer. Your customer can help you be successful if you communicate to them of what you need help with. Your customer can also, what I have done is they can loan you employees. If you help, if you help teach them what you need and how they can participate with you, they will help you. It doesn't change your price. Just how do you work it? We'll talk about systems and structure and market dynamics. Issues that impact your company as you move through the transitions to the next level. All three of these affect your business in different ways. The leadership piece, we just talked about that a little bit. Um, it's the founder is usually where you start. You add partners as you move along. Uh, I started my business in 19, my first one, I have five businesses over the years, six, um, and they've changed shape over the 30 years. They, they look different, they sound different. We even went through a, um, a brand change and changed up my customer base and my customer mix. All of those are growth strategies. And it's not scalable. It's not scaling. I'm just an, an individual. I had 17 employees. Now I'm back down to five employees. And then I went back up to 10. You just kind of move and up and flow with what you're working on and where you're going and what your clients and your customers need. So there, was, I, I was the founder. And my mentors had told me to never take on partners because you're not going to think alike. And that becomes challenges. Um, so in under 10 employees, you are typically one person. You might add someone to help you in sales or add someone to help you in the production manufacturing side. Even though you're a service company, let's say I notice a few people that are on this call and you're um, a landscaper or you're uh, a store owner, um, you still have people that can work with you as partners and you have a production process. Production just means I get an, how do I get an order? I get the order, I work the product or the service, I deliver the product or service and I collect fees. That's all production is. That's all what manufacturing is. Is something, it starts at the beginning, you work it through the five steps and then you collect your fees at the end. And when you move to the 10 million, which is about 50 employees, then you start getting t uh, titles, business titles, business structure, and business tools. So we'll talk more about those, those different changes that happen between the first barrier and the second barrier. Um, Robert, is there any way that, I, that we can do a little poll or faith and see how many who's our audience today? Are they under a million or over a million? That would be an easy one, maybe. I'll keep talking if 
we can put something together like that. Yeah, let's just everybody post in the chat real quick uh, where they're at. That probably okay. be the easiest way right now. All right. Oh yeah, I see that Faith put in there that if you have questions, please feel feel free to ask them along the way. I, I don't need to wait till the end. Under, yeah. under, under. Okay, good. So then I'll stay focused with that first barrier of under. Um, okay, good. Thank you. That helps. So why does business have to be so tough in delegation and collaboration? Why does, why does it have to be so tough? It's tough because we're growing. And what we think, we as individuals are growing. And our customers are moving and changing and their demands change. And so how do, we, how do we work with that? I put up at the top, delegation and collaboration. Delegation is kind of an old term. It comes from the, when I say an old term, the old autocratic system where you typically telling people what to do, delegating outward and um, the command and control model is a delegation word. Collaboration is a, more in the network terminology of how we work together and how we work as teams and knowing when to use which one of those you are gonna be using both of them. Sometimes you are delegating because you need it to get done and it's short-term task oriented. The collaboration piece is when you're building and growing. So building, you know, you're building a team, you're building a project, you're building a proposal, you're building something. And each person can participate in their area of expertise. So you're really managing and leading two different pieces, the delegation and the collaboration. Um, and so why do we delegate and why is delegating so hard? We have a hard time pinpointing, I find many CEOs and many business owners really don't know what their business is doing. They know how to make their product, they know how to sell their product, they know how to deliver their product. But when you ask them, what are the steps to actually getting your product out there or your service out there? And where can other people contribute and help? It's difficult for people to figure that out because they don't take the time to, to put in a process in their own mind. You know, what is it that I'm actually doing? So we're gonna be focusing on the doing piece, which is where the delegating collaboration comes. What do you need people to help you do? And understanding what it is you're doing makes a difference. Feedback is, is another piece of it that makes, that makes delegating difficult and collaborating um, makes both of them difficult because people don't like to give feedback and they don't like to receive feedback. So they only want to receive positive feedback. The negative feedback is difficult, but it's all feedback. And you need the feedback both from your customer and from your employees and from your vendors and from the marketplace to tell you if you're going in the right direction, making the right decisions, doing the right things to get you the money that you expect and the results that you expect at the end. The other piece that I find people have difficulty doing is measuring. Measuring accurately and measuring the right things. So we're gonna talk about measuring and I have an accountability matrix. The two things in parentheses are tools that I have for you to take a look at, well, what, how do I pinpoint what, I need, what I'm doing and what I can delegate and what I need to keep? Because it matters. And feedback, I'll talk a little bit about that next week. And the measurement piece is an accountability matrix that goes with your flow chart. How do I hold people accountable? And holding people accountable doesn't mean it's punishment, doesn't mean it's, it's, it's just tracking so that you can stay on track and on time and be able to analyze the work that you're doing to get more efficient. Remember, it's time over money. How am I spending my time? And how am I spending my money? So that the flow chart is important so you can pinpoint what you're doing, getting feedback from the marketplace and from others, and then measure what it is you're doing so that you can make improvements and get better at it and charge appropriately. 
And then the recognition piece is recognizing people that participated in making the results happen. Okay. I wanted to show you an example of what I'm talking about on the flow chart so that you can see what delegating, where delegating fits. I've worked, I give everybody in my roundtables, they have worked um, these flow charts that we need to, that they need to do. This is only one area of a of an organization. This is in a, it sells bulk order, so it's in the warehouse and they have inventory. It, where it is, each of the departments has one of these. It's taking a look at what are you actually doing? You have a client at the top. What happens when a client places an order? What happens in the warehouse? Where does the order actually go? And you follow the steps. So out of the green, the green are all my profit centers. The yellow are support pieces. And so we color code them to, to help you. And you could be a simple, simple company, you know, as, as making cupcakes that you can do this. And it's, it's helping you understand what actually goes into my business process so that I can look at it. And I can now see, well, what do I really like to do? What pieces do I like to do? Because we know that if we're doing things that we like to do, we're excited about it, we're energized about it, we're passionate about it, we're gonna do a really good job at it and people will pay you for it. But we also know in all of our businesses, there are a lot of pieces of it we don't like and that we're not very good at because we don't like it, but it needs to be done. Yes, it does. All five pieces of your business need to be done. The sales needs to be business development, sales, marketing, uh, production, warehousing, delivery, and collections, bill it, invoicing and collecting. All have to be done, but we're not good at all of the pieces. So how do we identify what actually takes place and who actually does it? Where can my customer help? Where do I need help? So that's your procurement piece. You're procuring resources. It can be 1099 people. It can be W2 people. It can be other, it can be my customer can help me if they have an extra staff person, which I've run into many times. They want to teach their marketing person how to do some things. So I'll, I'll use them and let them be my employee, but they get paid by the, by the client. So this is a visual to show what a flow chart looks like, how it goes together, and what do we do with it when once we get it together. The, the feedback I've had from some new people is I didn't do my flow chart because it looked just time consuming and like a bunch of paperwork that I didn't want to do, didn't see any value. Okay, well then I can't tell where we can increase our prices. Um, are, you, are your processes correct? Uh, where can we get time out of your process? How can we improve the process so we can spend less time? And can we charge more? There's some places in here that your client can't do for anything. And so you can charge them more for pieces that they can't do and, turn and help, let them help you on pieces that they can help you with. So the, the flow charts, he actually did do them. And then at the end, found that he, had, he was missing two processes. And that's what was making his company, he had to work harder to, to get the output to happen because he was missing some pieces. And we also found that he had the wrong people in the wrong seats. He had people doing things that they didn't like doing. And so they were doing a bad job at it and getting a bad result. So we phased that person out, moved him into a different job and he's much happier. And we hired a lower cost person to do a different job. So we, we moved, we aligned the people to fit their capabilities and we outsourced from other areas. Um, I see a question up here. It says, I often see a lack of attention to an undervaluing foundation HR benefits because of obstacles that has to do, has to properly address and manage the business growth to succeed. Um, lack of attention to undervaluing a solid foundation for HR. Mm. That's true because a lot of people don't know HR has two pieces. 
that's more of a statement versus a question, which is good, which is fine. Um, HR has two pieces. One is benefits and compensation and compliance. The other side is talent management and talent development. So we've separated those two activities so that you can get the, the right people focusing on the business growth. Uh, a lot of times the compliance people don't have the skill set or the knowledge or even the interest in growing the business. They want to make sure the employees are taken care of properly and that they have the benefits that they need. So this, uh, we use a flow chart to see how are the people being used? Is the talent really being leveraged or do we have a, a misalignment? Typically, most of the time there's a misalignment happening, especially with startups because startups growing to the next level. Yeah, I think there's, there's a book out there that says what, what got you here won't get you there. So you will make some changes. The people that helped you in your first two or three years will not be the people that will be with you in five to eight years, typically, because the company grows at a different pace than people grow. So you have a natural evolution of people moving through your company. And the compliance piece is really important. And the talent development piece is really important, but they are not the same. Thank you for that observation. Um, let's move on to the next one. Here's another flow chart. Again, these, this company is only a $3 million company. So you can see the pieces that they have to go through in each of your businesses have pieces just like this. Again, I know a few people on the call and they're, they're very detailed in this way. And so I love it when they put their, the more detail you can get, it's not granular. There's something that's different. But if you can identify the steps, you actually can really see where your money is going and where your time is going. Remember, business is about the game of business is time over money. How do I work less and make more? You can only tell that when you put these flow charts together to see where is your time going and where's my money coming from. So when we do strategic planning, it's about that alignment in your business and the balance of managing the talent properly. Okay. I want to go to the accountability matrix because I'll go back. Let's see if I can go back. Um, don't know how to go back. But anyways, you have the flow chart. And once you've identified who's doing what, we put in an accountability chart. So these are two, two big pieces of this presentation. Are these the flow chart for leadership? in people development and aligning your resources, and then the accountability piece so that we can measure what the expectations are. It, you, I put these together for my clients, for my customers. What do I expect of them? Because there, I do have an expectation of my customers. There's something I need, there are things I need them to do. One of them is to communicate with me. Another one is to give me the information that I need so that I can be successful in helping them grow. So that sometimes has to be communicated. This sort of is kind of like a contract and you can do different things with it, but it's really looking at what, again, what do you need the person that's helping you? What do you need them to do? And then how do you prioritize it? And the time that is spent, how's that 100% of their time? How, how do you need that work coming to you so that you're working together on a project and working in a rhythm that are the same? Sometimes I have run into an accounting person that is moving slower than what I need. So if I use a chart like this, I need to make decisions quicker. I put that as a priority, number one. And for now, and they need to spend 50% of their time on it for the next two weeks. It's not forever. So it's not a job description. I use this in lieu of a job description because I just need it for two weeks because I need to make it, I have a deadline. And then after the two weeks are up, then we change this up a little bit and look at it again. And then there's success factors that go on here. I got this chart. There's success factors of what does success look like? Sometimes there's metrics in there. So if the person knows what you expect, these are your expectations. 
um, knows what you expect, or sometimes there's a, like you need to answer, you know, the phone needs to be answered in the third ring. You've heard that before. So, but it needs to be put down there so that they know what you expect. Because everybody, especially in this time of diversity and inclusion, we have all kinds of people that have different backgrounds, different experiences, um, different knowledge, different training. This is a good way to help them know what you want and what you expect so that you can deliver a quality product and they can help you. So this sets you both up for success. Okay, I'm gonna take a minute and ask for questions. Um, any questions out there? I don't know, you could use the chat or the question box. Um, okay, I'll keep going. And the one thing, what is the one thing, now that we talked about the flow charts, because that's helping us identify what to delegate. And now we want to talk about the, the accountability matrix is what are they going to do? Who's going to do it now? Who's going to do it? And you work through that of who can do this. And whenever I do the accountability charts, I don't, I don't put a name on it because I use them like, um, I call them job tickets. But here are some things that need to be done because I use interns as well. And you can, you can use 1099s, you can use interns, and you can do full-time employees. Full-time employees require about four accountability items to make it worth your time and your money. Interns are quick. They use about 20 hours worth. So there's very different mixes on how much work people can do. So your workflow, again, your flow charts really matter on how you distribute the work so that you can delegate. You have someone to delegate to and you have some accountability and some measurables so that people can succeed in helping you. Okay. The next piece is the systems and structure. Because remember, we just finished up looking at the, the um, accountability matrix and the flow charts. Now you have systems and structure. And which comes first, the systems or the structures? And my HR people that are out there, they're, again, we're looking for alignment and matching so that your business runs smoothly, efficiently, efficiently, and we're trying to streamline, again, time over money. How much time does it take me to do an activity and how much money do I get for that time? I focus on growing companies. I don't have to hire more people and I don't have to spend any more money. So I don't, when I say spend more money, I don't need to get a new facility or a new plant. I can, I can grow, you can grow with what you have. And that's what I'm trying to teach you and give you some tools of how to look at your business. So you can grow without spending any more money, without adding more people, just to looking at what you're doing and how's the work being done. So when we look at systems and structure, I'm, I'm glad the pandemic came through because I, you know, yes, it's a, it's, it's a, a misfortune for many people in getting sick and all of those issues that go with it. But on the business side, as a strategic planner, it really helped us streamline our business processes. It moved us into using the technology like Zoom that we're doing today to allow the amount of people to be on this call. You didn't have to travel. You didn't have to go anywhere. You get the knowledge and the education. We, it wouldn't, we wouldn't be learning at this pace that we're learning if the pandemic didn't come through. We wouldn't be using our resources and our tools as efficiently as we are now. We wouldn't have put in flexible work hours. We've been talking about it for 30 years but employers just wouldn't do it. So now they have to do it. And we're actually much more efficient than we were prior pandemic. So there's a lot of advantages when you do your, your strategic planning, starting with your flow charts, your accountability matrix, you can really look at how do I streamline my business and take advantage of the opportunities when, 
you know, there's looks at opportunities are in crisis. How do you take advantage when something goes wrong? So when we look at systems and structure, it's where are you when you're when you're down here in the less than ten employees? How are you set up? Systems and structure is improving your communications. How do you communicate with each other? Is it just by word of mouth and we talk to each other around the the, the water cooler, or do we actually get together and um, meet? online you know how how are we communicating do we use we know the younger kids coming through our text messaging and used to gaming so that matters that's how people communicate and virtual schooling and virtual working uh, we're doing some studies right now on how work gets done um, the flexible work schedule you know and, and how to combine the traditional structure with the at-home structure and how do we how do we use the resources that are out there to leverage and continue to grow so 10 employees or less there are certain strategies that go into place and the way you're set up and then once you get you know like to the once you start to get to the 20 22 employees it changes again and then when you get to 75, 50 to 75 employees, it changes again. So you have different steps, which are these, again, these barriers where things change, your systems change and your structure change. We used to communicate really well when there were only two of us. Now we've got four and we work in different states, different cities, different locations. Communication isn't as easy. So what do you do? That's what this talks about. So we have some, this is a, a picture, a visual of when you're just two to two, one to one, and you're talking, communication goes fine, goes great. So as soon as you move, we only added two more people, but now there's 12 different ways to communicate. So you can see where miscommunication happens frequently. And we've always talked about emails being difficult and text messages to be difficult because you have many, many ways that technology, oops, sorry. We have many ways that, that our communication can go wrong. It typically goes wrong, goes misunderstood, not smoothly. So how do we improve? And I have many small businesses that say, well, I could just add more people, I'll add more people. I've got one right now that he's growing from, what was he, 750 million and he's going to a billion. He said, I'll just add more people. There are not more people to add. So what are you gonna do? There are not more people to add. So we have to use our technology. What are some other strategies to minimize the type of work that we're doing? Because we cannot add more people and still communicate and get the work done. Because the goal doesn't change. The financial goal does not change. Market dynamics is the next piece. Um, back to systems and structure. When, when I work with companies and when you work with your consultants or your mentors or your advisors, look at that systems and structure because the systems and structure is a really important piece of how are you, again, how are you communicating? You can control that, you can manage that, you can get the software. There are things that you can do inside that, that space to make the communication flow better. You can, you can see in your own businesses, quality drops off because there was a miscommunication someplace that those need to be looked at and fixed all the time and put bridges in there and to stop gaps. The next piece that we talk about, remember I said there are three components of barriers to growth. One is the leadership and what do we delegate? How do we include others and collaborate? Collaboration is difficult, so we need tools to help us do that. Systems and structure is the other piece of that. How are we set up to support those flow charts and the work that we're doing? How do we support it so that things don't fall through the cracks? And how do we communicate with each other to keep it tight so that we're not doing rework? Rework costs money, rework costs time. And the other, the third piece is market dynamics. 
What are market dynamics? Dynamics have two market dynamics has two pieces to it. One is the cash cash flow coming through. Um, this chart got a little uh, cattywampus, I guess you could say when I when I transferred it to a different software program. <coughs> Excuse me, but we have our cash management. Um, so we go from revenue. Any any sales is good sales. I, I, I know you're all shaking your head going that that's not true. I'm hoping you're shaking your head that that's not true. We know that any revenue is not good revenue. So it's, it's we work hard to get really good customers. And what does a good customer look like? What does a good client look like? So that we, we can then plan our cash flow, which is the next category. So we go from revenue generation, any customer is a good customer, cash flow, is to figuring out, you know, how do I get monthly re repeatable income so you can manage your business better and you can delegate and hire people if you can manage your cash flow. So and what does that cash flow look like and how do I make it predictable? And then we manage, whoops, gross margin. How do I go back? Sorry, we were almost done. There we go. Uh, managing gross margin. Uh, I like to put in net margin because net margin has more value than gross margin. Gross margin is just, you know, cash in, cash out. You take out your what your cost, and then the rest of that money is mine. Well, there there's another way to build in net margin. Net margin is more difficult, but that's what I put into the system. The gross margin is what you can start with and then predictable profitability. So those are the, you can see under the 10, you're constantly chasing revenue. And I know, again, I know so many people on this call, revenue, revenue, revenue. A lot of your marketing, there's a lot of marketing webinars, there's sales webinars, that's all generating revenue. Cash flow is something a little bit different. How do we make it predictable and on a regular basis? So 10 employees to 25 employees, is what you're is where you're getting that cash reliability and predictability. So um, I didn't see that Robert had something around uh, cash management or financial management. We I know I have a kid, a child that is 21. He has never learned in high school or in college how to do financial management. Financial management we have to learn on our own. We learn through webinars and we learn typically what I have found is many of the startups learn by being penalized. So you get caught somehow, you missed a report, you missed a payment, you, miss, you missed something because it's very easy to miss. So that cash flow management is really critical into growing your company. And I encourage you to find as many webinars as you can take as many workshops as you can take on cash flow management and how to how to get predictable in your finances. Um, the gross margin will come later and predictable profitability will come later. But it's those first two pieces, one getting good customers that pay on a regular basis. And then number two is how to get it at a, a sustainable monthly income coming in. Okay. And that's, that's work, it's practice. It's not strategic, but you need to have that cash to keep going. This is a chart that I use now that we've gone through the four, the three pieces of leadership systems and structure and market dynamics. It's for strategic planning, remember your goal is time over money, time over money to win in business. And I need to make more money for my time spent. How do I work less, make more? These three areas are three areas to focus your energy on. And then the levels, these are where the barriers were. So when you're a founder, you know, a startup, when they say startup, you could be 10 years and still be in a startup phase. So think about that. Oops. So we have... Um, Founders, office systems, and revenue. 
those are the two, the three areas that, that we focus on. And once you get some good systems in place, you have a couple of really key people, usually three is a good number. You have somebody in charge of money, somebody in charge of sales and revenue, and then somebody that's in charge of the business flow and the business process. Those are your top three people. And then you get support people after that that kind of come and go. But those three areas, it's hard to have one person that can do all of them and grow. So if you have buddies, partners, you know, relationships that can help you and divide it up into those three sections, you're good. Office systems to support you in your communication of you, the three of you and your ancillary support people. How do you communicate? A lot of times we pick the communication systems that our customers use so that we can communicate with our systems and customers effectively. And then the revenue piece, you're constantly looking at, am I getting, getting my money's worth? Because as entrepreneurs, as in solopreneurs, we have a tendency to not charge enough. So that's why I go back to the flow chart. You can charge more. You undercharge all the time. Even my big companies, they undercharge or they don't really understand where their value is because where your value was when you started and where the value is when you're five years old is different. I guarantee you it's different. And then when you're eight years old, your value again is different. So your customers should be changing on a regular basis. As you grow, your customers will grow. You'll get better customers that will pay you more and pay you consistently. So the goal is to work through, how do I just get any revenue to predictable cash flow? When you have predictable cash flow, you have a lot of opportunities in front of you and a lot of options in front of you. So those are the things that we wanted to talk about in barriers to growth today. So that you see the three areas that is in your strategic planning, in your growth strategies, in your growth plan for your company, that these are the three areas that you're constantly looking at and leading because you're the only one that can create that future for your company. The operation pieces, you get workshops and webinars, you learn how to do marketing plans, business plans, financial plan, you learn how to do all that. But what do you do with that? And how do you how do you use it to help you with your leadership systems and structure and market dynamics? So the other piece of market dynamics that we're run, that we've run into now is the war and um, politics and uh, pandemic is still is still out there. So we have a shortage of people. So those are market dynamics that you cannot do anything about. You cannot control. You cannot influence. So those are, are barriers on your company, but they're also opportunities if you're prepared and ready to take advantage of them. So with that, I reviewed really quick. Next time, oh, I think um, Robert and I changed that out, that we're not gonna do successful habits until July. But what we will do is for the next one is put in the, uh, ex the roadmap, right? That's what we talked about next time. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take the three barriers and give you a roadmap to walk through, to fill out. It has a front and a back. It's quite detailed of how to, how to measure your company and grow your company in a planned way and use it and be accountable for yourself, for your own growth. I use it for college kids too when you're trying to pick a college because it has values in there. And you know, what, do you, what are your growth expectations for yourself? Because your company will only grow as much as you do. So you have to plan your personal growth in order for your company to grow. So with that, I think we'll conclude today. We've met our time allotment. We talked about flowcharts so that you can see what your company is actually doing, not services it provides, but what are you actually doing? And then the accountability charts for metrics, um, alignment of your resources, what kind of resources do you need? How do you put them together? And then we talked about revenue and how do you get money for what you do? So thank you for today's opportunity. And I hope to hear from some of you, I'm, I'm open. My doors are open. I have a lot of tools I just give away because that's, I want you to succeed and you can succeed. So, and you will. 
if you have tools to help you. Thank you, Robert, for allowing me this time. Oh, thank you, Donna. I appreciate it. Now, we have a few minutes left, so if you have any questions, please post those in the Q&A. Um, I do have a question, Donna. Um, yeah. When you're looking at the, the strategies or the structures and the procedures piece, at yeah. what point in your business should you start really looking at that? I, let's say I'm a solopreneur. I have me, myself, and I are the three people running the company. Um, mm -hmm. When should I start documenting and doing the flow chart, documenting those procedures? Should I do it as a one-person company or should I wait? I would do it as a one-person company. The mentors I had, remember I started 35 years ago. I was a, I was a solo, I, not even a solopreneur. I was just a person. I was 27 at the time and thought, you know, just like many of you, I can start a company. It's really easy to do. I can just, I can do something. I had my mentor in my third year. Oh, a statistic that, that I did not tell you that we've had 4.4 million companies start up in the last two years. We will lose 80% of those in the first two years. First two years, 80% will be gone. So if you're here after, you know, your fifth year or into your fifth year, you're one of the special ones. You really are one of the special ones. So in my third year, I had a mentor talk to me and say, so what does your process look like? I'm like, my what? I do this and then I do this and then I do this. And they made me, they wouldn't give me any more money. I asked for a price increase. They wouldn't give me any more money until I put my process together. And it's as simple as five boxes. Just like Robert said, there's three of us. What do the three pieces do? How does an order, how do you find an order? Where does it go when it comes in? And just map it out. I have a couple of consultants that I work with to help them get their, get their prices up. We put together seven steps that they do because they wear all three hats. Which one has the greatest value to the customer? So you know where your money is coming from and that's what you charge for. And then we look at the other two like Robert said, there's me, myself, and I that are doing it. Well, me can do something really, really well, but myself and I, we're not so good at that. So it takes a lot of time. And that's where you start developing those other relationships or finding tools or resources to help you in those, those other three areas. But until you have your pieces mapped out, so it could be even just seven charts, seven boxes, just starts as a box chart. Then you then you can you now have a tool that you can share with a Robert and I know that the the boot camp has mentors attached to it and so some of those mentors can help you with that too of how do I expand my flowcharts how do I expand the work that I'm doing so I can see it better and now people can help you and you can talk about what you need help with. Excellent, great response. I don't see any other questions in there, so that's okay. It's a the Tuesday after a holiday, so there's no problem getting ready have a few minutes back in their day. Um, we appreciate everybody being here with us today. Um, and Donna, do you have any closing, closing remarks you want to share? Um, I know growing a business is really difficult because we get wrapped up in our work and we like our work. So the, the path of least resistance is just to do more work because we know how to work really hard. That's how we got to be an entrepreneur. But working really smart on the right things is not so easy. And you, you do have to have tools to help you identify what are the easy things for you to do and how do, we, how do you make it go? Because if you're this far, if you're five years into your business and you're 500,000, 300,000, something like that, you've got some momentum. How do we leverage that momentum? And you're, it's going to go. It's, it's delegating some of the pieces, giving up some things. And it's, it's fun. Being an entrepreneur is fun. I said I've started five companies because I like it. It's fun. And it gets to include other people. And that's fun too. So make your job fun. Make your work fun. Use your customers. Use your clients. And make it a, make it a fun thing. Make it a party every day. And you'll make money. Excellent. Thank you, Donna. Again, we want to thank everybody for being here with us, and we look forward to seeing you next week as Donna shares that roadmap with everybody and uh, talks about the roadmap piece a bit more. So uh, again, thank you. Have a great week, and we will see you soon. Thank you so much.